Good to see everyone tonight. Hope everyone's had a good day today. If you're visiting with us tonight, we want to extend a welcome to you. Invite you to come back and worship with us any time that you have the opportunity to do so. You know, one of the downsides to having our lesson topics published in the bulletin each week is sometimes preachers change their mind. Sometimes we decide that we want to do something a little bit different. Sometimes between the times that I send those lessons to Betty and to Carolyn for the bulletin, sometimes I get to thinking about things and studying things and decide I want to go in a little bit different direction. Well, that's what we're going to do tonight. You know, God's Word describes for us many, many people who were considered faithful to our Heavenly Father. Their wisdom developed from an obedience to the Lord's commands leads them to being in a position of favor with God. We read of men such as Abraham and his great faith and wisdom. We read about the wisdom that Moses had in being able to lead the children of Israel and to manage many of the problems and the issues that arose during that time. We read about Solomon and how God bestowed upon him a great amount of wisdom. Yes, we read throughout God's word and we find mention of many, many faithful men. But all too often we overlook another significant group. All too often we overlook wise women. There are many times when women as a result of their abilities of perception, their greater desire to serve God, and even at times their emotional differences that they have from men that can aid them in being more wise than men in certain situations. We know of many such women in the church today that we look to as being wise, who are very intelligent in the Word of God. In fact, if we were to think back to the earliest days of our Christian training, more than likely it was our mother who initially began to teach us the Word of God. We think about Bible classes when we were children. We think about those fundamental concepts, those elementary principles that were taught to us by those godly women. That foundation of faith is something that so many of us can look back upon. And we see that that foundation was laid by women of wisdom. Well, tucked away right in the middle of the second census of Israel, we find an obscure story about an interesting group of ladies. If you would be opening your Bibles to Numbers chapter 27, Numbers chapter 27 is where we're going to begin our lesson tonight. But we're first introduced to these ladies in Numbers chapter 26 and verse 33. In this passage it says, And Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, had no sons but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mala and Noah and Hogla and Milcah and Terzah. Now this family of five daughters and no sons was quite unique among the children of Israel and the lack of a male heir created quite a dilemma for this family the way in which that they resolved this situation brings them briefly into the forefront of the history of God's people And we find that just in the few brief lines that are presented to us about these women, we find that the inspired writers gives us a glimpse into the wisdom that these daughters of Zelophehad contained. Now, although we know very little about these women, we know very little about their life, what we do read about them in the scriptures should serve as a powerful testimony to us a powerful example of the way that a Christian woman is to conduct themselves, but also 
we find some teachings here, some illustrations of things that men can apply to their lives. And we can apply that to the relationships that we have with the women that are in our lives. And certainly there's not anyone here today who would deny the fact that young Christian women need good, sound role models need people that they can look up to, people that are wise, people that are going to lead them in the right way because the role models that the world is putting in front of our young women today are far from that. They are ones that are given over to rebellion, to immodesty, to sensuality, and just an overall crudeness. They don't display those traits of grace and goodness and kindness And so we should be happy to find role models like we find in the daughters of Zelophehad who had some of the very characteristics that Christian women should strive for today. Now if you would, turn with me to Numbers chapter 27. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. And the first thing that I want us to notice about these ladies is the fact that they were willing to speak what was right. They were willing to speak the right thing. Notice it says, Then came the daughters of Zelophehad. They were coming before the leaders of Israel. The daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Messiah, or of Manasseh, who the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of the daughters, Mala and Noah and Hogla and Milcah and Terzah, And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation saying, Our father died in the wilderness. Now the significance of this was the patriarch of the family is the one that they should have gone to initially to handle any type of issues, to answer any kind of questions that they may have had. So here they are now coming to Moses, they're coming to Eleazar, they're coming to the leaders of these other tribes, and they're saying, we've got a question. There's a situation that has arisen, and we really don't know the proper way that this needs to be handled. They say that our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he hath no son? Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad speak right. They say that which is right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And if he have no daughter, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his brethren. And if he have no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then ye shall give his inheritance unto the kinsman that is next to him in his family." And he shall possess it, and it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment, as the Lord commanded Moses. So in this initial conversation, they're concerned. They know that their father has died. They know that they have no brothers. And they're concerned as to what is going to happen with them. Are they still going to receive some type of inheritance since there is no male heir there? And so they come to Moses, they come to the other leaders of Israel looking for a solution. So we see they've come to the right place, they've spoken the right thing, they came, they expressed their concern. But also I want you to notice, these women were willing to do something that it's sometimes difficult to do. They were willing to admit the shortcomings of, of their father. You know, sometimes it's hard for us to admit when we have a loved one that falls into sin. It's hard for us to admit when someone that is close to us does something that is wrong. 
But these, will, these women, they were willing to admit the fact that their father had done something wrong. And we admire these sisters, these daughters of Zelophehad. We admire them for having enough integrity to avoid exaggeration, but also to avoid dumbing down the situation. They simply presented it as it was. They spoke what was right. But notice how they did this. They started out by saying that their father had died in the wilderness, but that he was not one of those that had rebelled against God and against the leadership of Moses under the guidance of Korah. Now you may remember this story from Numbers chapter 16. It's a very, uh, very interesting story. The family of Korah had positioned themselves into a place where they were trying to lead people away from following Moses. They were stirring up a rebellion and there were many people that were beginning to turn against Moses and began to follow the teachings of Korah and the leadership of Korah. But we remember what happened in that situation. We find that Moses and his, uh, his right to be the leader was vindicated for the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, his family, and all of those that had become his followers. But notice the daughters of Zelophehad said, this is not how our father died. He was not one of those that had been a part of that rebellion. But they did go on to say, but he did die in the wilderness. But he did die because of sin. Now most likely the reference here is to the sin of going along with the ten unfaithful spies. You remember whenever they got to the border of the promised land, that there were twelve spies that were sent to spy out on that land. And when they came back, ten of those spies said, there is absolutely no way. There's no way that we can accomplish this. They've got large fortified cities. There's giants in the land. We, that we just don't have enough strength but then you had two, Joshua and Caleb, who stepped forward and said that with God they could accomplish it. That with God on their side, that they could accomplish it. Well, the majority of the people went along with the ten unfaithful spies. They allowed their faith to grow weak. And they believed the report of these men that this was something that they just could not accomplish. And so as we read in Numbers 14 verses 29 through 30, God said, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me doubtless. You shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Now think about the tragedy of an entire generation of people losing their life. They were forced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until every person in that generation, every person over the age of 20, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, died in the wilderness. This tragedy came about due to disbelief because they did not keep their faith in God. Well, we see this used as an illustration again in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 3 verses 16 through 19 where the writer says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses... But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. And so here we find these daughters of Zelophehad. They're saying, no, our father, he was not a part of the rebellion of Korah, but he did go along with the unfaithful spies. But he did lose his life in the wilderness because of sin. And folks, to me, that displays a great maturity on their part. 
It displays a, a, a great degree of wisdom in that they recognize that their father was in the wrong. They recognized that he had made a mistake, and as a result, he lost his life, was not able to enter into the promised land. But also, we see that these ladies spoke what was right in regard to God's plan for his people. Like the rest of the younger generation of Israel, they had witnessed their parents all die in the wilderness. That whole generation... They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they finally got to enter into the promised land. Yet at the end of a 40-year period, they still had faith in God's promise. They still recognized that that possession was to be theirs, that inheritance of that promised land was to be theirs. Not only did they still believe, they still were determined to have a part in the promised land. That's why they came to Moses. They wanted to ensure that what they had been striving for, what they had yearned for, that they were still going to receive that, even though they were in kind of a unique situation. But God's intentions for his people are even greater today. In our time, God desires that every person will be saved eternally. You may remember Paul in writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 verses 3 and 4 said, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For those who are wise today, we face a long and sometimes difficult road to the prize. Just like those who were the a part of the children of Israel who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years before they ever were allowed to set foot into the promised land. But like these daughters of Zelophehad, we must never lose faith. Never allow ourselves to grow weak and forget what God has in store for us. That regardless of what we face in this life and how hard those struggles may be from time to time, that heaven will be our home. We keep that as our focus. But also, whenever we look at these ladies, we find that they were wise because they listened when other people spoke that which was right. Following this initial interview, a problem came to the attention of the leaders of Israel. And in striving to both please God and bring harmony back to the people, they sought out an admirable solution. If we turn to Numbers chapter 36, we'll pick up our reading again in verse 1. Numbers chapter 36, beginning in verse 1. And the chief fathers of the families of the children of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near and spake before Moses and before the princes, the chief fathers of the children of Israel, and they said... The Lord commanded my God to give the land for an inheritance by lot to the children of Israel. And my Lord commanded by the Lord to give the inheritance of Zelophehad our brother unto his daughters. And if they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then shall their inheritance be taken from the inheritance of our fathers and shall be put to the inheritance of the tribe wherewith they are received." so shall it be taken from our lot of the inheritance. So stop right there for just a moment. The other people that were a part of that lineage, that were a part of the tribe of Manasseh, they're looking at this situation. They're saying, okay, now we know that God has told Moses that the daughters of Zelophehad, that they are supposed to have their part and their parcel in this inheritance. But what happens if they marry someone from another tribe? That's supposed to be the inheritance of the tribe of Manasseh. Well, what happens if they marry someone from another tribe? Is that possession not then going to become a part of that other tribe? And so the tribe of Manasseh was looking at this, trying to reason it out among themselves, and they were looking at it as a loss. 
that if these ladies were given part of that inheritance and then married someone from another tribe, then that other tribe was going to amass a greater inheritance than what the tribe of Manasseh was receiving. And so Moses goes to the Lord again. He speaks to the Lord. And rather than read this whole section of scripture, if you want to mark down, read down through verse 12 at some time. The solution that they came up with was this. That in order to, using a more modern term, in order to make it fair all around, in order to appease everyone in this situation, what the Lord declared was that these ladies certainly had the right to marry but they could only marry someone from their own tribe. They could only marry someone from the tribe of Manasseh. That way, that land would remain a part of that inheritance. They were told that they were only to marry the sons of their father's brothers. So they were told you're to go to your cousins, those of your distant family, those that are a part of that same tribe. And those were the ones that they were at liberty to marry. Now, the day of Jubilee would have protected them from the selling of property, but they couldn't do anything about an inheritance that would stay in the husband's family. And so if these ladies had married someone from another tribe, that inheritance would have become a part of the husband's lineage. It would not have remained with the wife's family. And so in order to rectify that situation, Moses went to the Lord and they made this declaration that in order for that possession to remain within that tribe, that these women were limited in who they were allowed to marry. Now, when we look at this situation with the eyes of the world today, that sounds kind of unfair, doesn't it? In the eyes of the world today, we think, well, you should be able to marry whoever you want to marry. Is that not the prevailing philosophy that we see? Well, when it comes to marriage and who we want to marry, limitations are hardly ever welcome. And that's why so often we see young people who will rebel. They'll go against the desires of their parents And they'll go out and they'll marry someone that they know is the exact opposite of who their parents want them to marry. Well, so often, marriage that begins in rebellion ends in division, ends in divorce. But whenever we look at the scriptures, here we find a true display of, of godly obedience. A true display of godly wisdom on these ladies' part because they were willing to yield. They knew that that was God's intention for them. James records in James 3 and verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality. And so the wisdom that comes from God, it is always going to be that which is good. It is always going to be that which is going to bring about the best impact, the best result upon the one that accepts and follows it. But let's think about this from the standpoint of Christians today. The New Testament tells us that there are certain people that are not allowed to marry. Matthew 5, 32, 19, 9, and also 1 Corinthians 7 speak of not marrying one who is guilty of adultery. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39 commands Christian widows and widowers that they must marry in the Lord. Now there are some that look at that statement and they say, well, that simply means that they are to marry someone that has the scriptural right to marry. But if you look at the original language that is used there and the context that is used there, that is not what this passage is saying. Paul is saying that a Christian widow or widower, if they are going to remarry, they need to marry a Christian. 
And one thing that I generally always say in that situation is that if you are a Christian man or a Christian woman and you have been married to a good, strong Christian man or woman, why would you want to marry someone that is not a good, strong Christian man or woman? Also, a wide array of verses command us that we are to marry only one of the opposite sex. You know what? That should be something that we don't even have to mention. But the example of these daughters of Zelophehad help us to have the right spirit about accepting and obeying God's will. Not rebelling against what God's will is says for us to do but to accept it recognizing that that is what is the best but then let's look at the end of the story the final chapter in the story of these ladies takes place many years later Joshua records in Joshua 17 verses 3 through 6 the daughters of Zelophehad they have come to him they have conquered the promised land and he is handing out the inheritance Dictating where each person is going to dwell. But Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons but daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Malan, Noah, and Haglan, Milcah, and Terzah. And they came near before Eleazar the priest, and before Joshua the son of Nun, and before the princes, saying, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our brethren. Therefore, according to the commandment of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brethren of their father, and there fell ten portions to Manasseh beside the land of Gilead and Bashan, which were on the other side of Jordan, because the daughters of Manasseh had an inheritance among his sons, and the rest of Manasseh's sons had the land of Gilead. So along with the family of Manasseh, the daughters of Zelophehad, are taking up residence now in the promised land. They are being given their portion of that inheritance that had been promised to them many, many years before. But when we notice the last three verses of Joshua chapter 21, it says, And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. And the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. So we see due to the wise conduct, the wisdom of the daughters of Zelophehad, they were ultimately able to share in the inheritance of the promised land. Now something that I want you to notice from this. Notice that the sin of their father was not held against them. Notice the fact that their father had rebelled. That he had lost his life among those who were not allowed to enter the promised land. Their father was the one that left them in this precarious situation. Notice they were not punished for that. But because of their wisdom. Because of their willingness to obey the word of God. And to seek the Lord's counsel. And to be willing to accept the things that he set forth for them. Then we find they received that blessing. They received that home in the promised land. And ultimately, that is the goal of all righteous living. Through wise living, we today all share the possibility of an even greater blessing. Through wise living, through obedience to the will of God, we have the promise of an inheritance in a promised land. No, it's not Israel. No, it's not the land of Canaan. No, it's not here in America as some would have us to believe about a renewed heaven and earth. It's that place that Jesus has gone to prepare. That place known as heaven. 
And if we will follow the example of those wise men and women of faith that we read about in the pages of God's Word, if we look to the example of people like the daughters of Zelophehad, and we see the strength, the devotion, and the willingness to remain obedient to God, and we follow that example, and we continue to live out that faith, we continue to seek the wisdom that comes from above. And we act upon the will of God. Then we know that heaven will be our home. But if you're not a child of God tonight, you need to realize that right now you don't have that hope. Because that hope only comes by having a relationship with Christ. Well, how do we get into that relationship with Christ? Well, first we must place our faith in Him. We have to believe that he is the son of God. But then we have to be willing to turn away from the things of this world. Turn away from our sins and become devoted to the things that are found within the pages of God's word. And then we come forward and we confess that we believe that Jesus is the son of God. And after making that confession, you submit yourself to the waters of baptism. There you'll come into contact with the saving blood of Jesus. Your sins will be washed away. And if you continue to live that faithful Christian life, the blood of Jesus will continue to cleanse you of your sins. But it may be that there is someone here who is not walking in the light, who is a child of God, but you've strayed away, you've grown weak. Something has happened in your life that has caused you to turn away from your devotion to God. Come back tonight. Be restored to the faith. Come forward and make that situation known. Let us go to the Father in prayer on your behalf. Begin again this evening, setting your sights on things above, being devoted to the things that we find in God's Word, living a wise, obedient existence. Tonight, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come at this time while together we stand and sing.